Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we are just going to wait a couple minutes um, to allow uh, others to join. Um, so we should start um, a few minutes after the hour. Thank you. Hi everyone, I think as people are joining, you could add into the chat who you are and where you're from, although we will be doing a little poll to find out some more about the participants here today. But just maybe a quick word about who you represent. I think we can get. I think we can get. Um, I'm hearing an echo. Hopefully, people are hearing my voice clearly enough. Hello, everyone. I am Nancy Muller, and I am the um, an independent consultant, uh, and also I am the co-chair of the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition Menstrual Health Supplies Workstream, along with Tanya Mahajan, <clears throat> who is on this call, and. Um, I am very happy to welcome you to this first in a series of webinars on menstrual waste management. And this particular one is on understanding the menstruator. This is uh, being hosted, co-hosted by um, RHSC and by um, the Intersectoral MHM and Emergencies um, Partnership at UNFPA which is UNHCR and UNFPA. And um, so this is on behalf of uh, Adrian Dongas, who is here, and um, also Tanya Mahajan and Madison Chauvin. Um, so we are the ones behind this particular series of webinars at the moment, and all the people who will be presenting and sharing information and the panelists, which I'll introduce in a minute. 
Um, so we have up to 90 minutes for this. Um, we expect a, a, a lot of questions. Please add them to the chat um, and we'll try to answer them as we go along and also uh, address them in the session to the extent that is possible. And um, we will also be doing some instant polls during this session. So we'll uh, put up, Madison will put up some questions in the chat. So please keep your eye on that and um, respond. There will be a couple of them that she'll be asking um, now. And uh, so if you could respond to those in the, in the chat, then we'll be able to, um, we will be able to get some feedback right away. But I think she's gonna wait for there to be a quorum of, oh, here it is, okay. <laughs> so Madison, do you wanna say something about this? Sure, absolutely. If you could just um, go ahead and please choose the um, predominant thematic area that you work in out of the options listed um, and feel free to choose other if you would like to report a different area and feel free to add that to the chat um, and also indicate the industry that you work in. Great, so yeah, if you can do that uh, just quickly and um, Madison will leave it up for a little bit and then we'll see the results and share, <clears throat> share that with everybody um, so that we know who's here. And um, before I introduce the presenters, um, I just would like to say that uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all and to have such great attendance and interest in this subject, which is one that hasn't gotten a lot of attention um, globally. Um, fortunately, men menstrual health has gained traction over the last decade or so, thanks to the incredible efforts of so many of you, um, this vibrant global community that's working um, very actively in menstrual health. And priorities have expanded um, through, through the time, although the focus continues to be often on addressing the stigma around menstruation, raising awareness and ensuring access to materials for the hygienic management of menstruation. And yet it has gotten deeper, which is great. Um, according to the recent LEAP report, uh, which RHSC supported, um, there are an estimated 1.67 billion menstruators across low and middle income countries. And of these, the majority use purpose-made disposable menstrual products, especially in the upper middle income countries. And that represents a lot of waste, even though we know that many use uh, reusable cloth and a smaller proportion reusable cloth pads and period panties and menstrual cups. Still the large bulk are disposable products. Yet in spite of this menstrual health and menstrual health waste management are subject to stigma and um, and being not discussed openly. So if menstrual health is something people don't wanna talk about, menstrual waste is really buried, often literally. So managing menstrual waste is not something that we want to think about or talk about generally. And actually managing waste is not something most countries tend to do really well. So the result is that the individual menstruator is often left holding the waste and having to figure out what to do with it. And in isolation, lacking sufficient guidelines or systems or even a willingness for it to be openly discussed. So we will hear from our presenters what this looks like globally and in several countries in particular. We will also hear some recommendations for action and funding to address the gaps. Addressing menstrual waste management, I think to many people seems like a bit of a tangent, but in fact, it's an essential way to contribute to, to help counter the stigma and the deprioritization of menstrual health. It also reinforces the understanding that menstrual health belongs to multiple sectors, including sexual reproductive health and rights, WASH, environmental health, humanitarian education, and gender equity. So with that, I would like to introduce our panelists, our presenters, um, and uh, then we'll get going on these exciting presentations. 
Um, the first uh, I will introduce in order of presenting is Danny Barrington, who is a lecturer at the University of Western Australia <clears throat> currently with other things that she has been involved with in other universities. And, <clears throat> and uh, also Ali Beeman, who is um, an MPH and works as a designer for health fellow with Y Labs in Rwanda. Joe Kwesiga is a senior product designer with Y Labs based in Uganda. Emily Cruz is a senior global lead for menstrual health with Splash in Seattle, Washington. And then the panelists will be um, our David Clatworthy, the WASH coordinator for the International Rescue Committee based in Uganda. Francesca Mazzola, senior program officer with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation here in Seattle. Lawrence West, the WASH and hum Urban Humanitarian Advisor for the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And Arundhati Morelli Daran, um, co-founder of the Menstrual Health Alliance of India. So with that, um, again, remember to use the chat, fill in the um, survey, and we will now start with uh, Danny Barrington's presentation. Okay, great. Thank you for the introduction, Nancy. Uh, so I'm going to be setting the scene by presenting some work that I did with one of my really wonderful PhD students, Hannah Robinson, who I know is, is lurking in the background there. Uh, and also she's the one who made these beautiful slides. I could not do as good a job as her by a long shot. So I thought I'd start as I'm the first speaker uh, about why we're really interested in menstrual disposal and also in the case of the work we've done, looking at um, reasons for different types of menstrual washing and drying. So the first one, and I'm sure we're all really familiar with this, is the technical side of things, is that often uh, people are putting used menstrual materials down toilets, whether that be into a septic system or a latrine pit or a, a sewer system where we're then having downstream issues with the technology, for example. We're also seeing that particularly in the last decade or so, there's been such a big push to get uh, people who menstruate everywhere access to menstrual products. But I say products because it generally has been disposable products, um, which has then had the actual disposal mechanism as a bit of an afterthought. It's been about the access and not about what happens later on. So we're having increased environmental pollution from uh, all of this extra menstrual waste. And then something I'm sure all of us are aware of working in the menstrual health space, um, menstrual status. And that in general, people knowing about your menstruation and particularly if they know about it because you have leaked and they've seen your menstrual fluid in some way um, can be a really uh, upsetting and it can sometimes be dangerous for people. I give this example here of this young girl who committed suicide after being shamed about her period. Um, and obviously, if you have used menstrual materials or you have washed your menstrual materials and people see them, then people do know what your menstrual status is. So it's really important that we're actually looking beyond just access and what happens afterwards. And then from a personal um, perspective, about five years ago, I was on the, um, the committee developing the international standard uh, for non-sewage sanitation yeah. systems. Uh, Someone, can someone turn off their mic? Thanks, sorry. Um, and these non-sewage sanitation systems, essentially these were the gates reinvent the toilet challenge toilets that were in people's houses. And it had been decided that the systems didn't need to be able to treat menstrual waste beyond menstrual fluid. Um, and I agreed with that, but I said, you know, we need to make sure that if these toilets that are in households are not going to need plumbers regularly and they're only going to be serviced once every six months or a year or two years, that if people do actually flush products down the toilet, um, households can fix that themselves so that the toilet's not decommissioned for a year or whatever. Um, and the response from the other members of the committee was, don't worry, we'll put a sticker on them that says, don't flush things. And that really <laughs> made me quite annoyed um, because I think 
we all know on this call that it's not just about education. Um, I really felt that we needed to have a way that these systems, if something was flushed, for example, um, it could be removed relatively easily. And I could see this was just a slow moving car wreck, essentially. And I, I was overruled in that, uh, you know, we won't put anything more in the standard. Um, and some of you might know me, I see the, I put the logo in the corner around shit happens and the wash failures initiative. Um, I felt like we were kind of flagging something really early on to address in terms of this menstrual waste issue, um, but I really wasn't getting any ground there. Um, and that's when I decided that we know there are issues, there's got to be evidence out there. Let's do a study where we pull together all of the existing evidence on why people dispose of or wash their menstrual materials in a certain way so that we can then inform the designers uh, of what it is that they need to be considering. Um, and so that is the systematic review that Hannah and I did. We ended up with 80 studies and we had a lot more in low and lower middle income countries than we did in high and upper middle income countries. It's quite interesting because we have seen a lot around fatbergs and people flushing menstrual products and uh, baby wipes and things in high income countries. But the solution to that seems to have been, we'll put signs on the door rather than look at why people are doing it. Um, in terms of what we did see, mostly in lower and uh, low or middle income countries, sorry, um, we were looking at studies that were evaluations of interventions. Um, so often where an NGO was providing uh, girls in school generally with menstrual products and research papers on knowledge, attitudes and practices uh, in particular regions. And we only included them if they had both what the practice for washing or disposal was and a reason given for why uh, that, that was practiced. Uh, we did see that there were a lot more uh, girls than women represented in the studies, as you might have seen from uh, Julie Hennigan's review from low and middle income countries um, on menstrual experiences and then our review in high income countries. Um, we do see a lot more research done with girls in low income countries and um, women in higher income countries, um, because that's kind of where the programmatic focus are, is are in those two different locations. So not to bore you any more with the, the methods there. Um, we found that there were three groupings of behavioural drivers, which were really important uh, in why people behaved in certain ways when it came to disposing and washing and drying menstrual materials. So the first was the state of available facilities and physical infrastructure was important. You know, was there actually a toilet there, a bin there, if that's what people needed, um, somewhere to wash pads, for example. But also these facilities, what uh, it really drove behaviour was the social perceptions of them. So for example, was there a lock on the door? So it was a private facility. Was there separate um, boys and girls toilets? So the boys couldn't see what you were doing with your menstrual materials. And then in almost as many studies, we saw that menstrual taboos and social stigma uh, really influenced behaviors. So cultural beliefs around what was, you know, the proper way of uh, washing or disposing of products. Uh, we saw embarrassment and worry, so these unpleasant emotions and some shame around people knowing what you're doing or seeing what you're doing. And then we saw fear as well. And we thought it was important to separate this out because this was people who were actually scared because they felt that there was a threat of danger or pain or something else that could harm them. Um, so, for example, the one that's often talked about is if people find out I have my period, they will think I'm having sex and therefore I might get beaten for that. And then we did find that in 14 of the studies out of 80, uh, a lack of knowledge was a driver of the behaviours that people chose to engage in. Um, so it definitely is a, um, a driver in some cases, but not as much of an influence as those advocating for stickers on doors would have us believe. And as you can see, because uh, there is overlap clearly in terms of how many studies we saw different drivers in, we wanted to just elaborate on the, some examples where we actually saw um, mixtures of these different drivers. 
So for example, in a couple of studies, we saw that girls hadn't been taught how to dispose of materials properly, but they were also too shy to ask people because of the stigma around menstruation. And so then they were just throwing their waste um, in the bushes or on the beach or wherever, away from where they were. And we also saw an example um, where a fully functional incinerator was installed out of school, uh, but it wasn't actually installed adjacent to the girls' toilets. So the girls would have to take their used menstrual materials with them out of the toilet across the school to put them in, in the incinerator. So even though the engineers had achieved, like they built a great incinerator, and even when these girls might have thought that incineration was a perfectly fine option for disposal, that step in between where a lot of people could find out their menstrual status was what stopped them actually using it. Um, so essentially what the word we're trying to get out from this work for designers, engineers, people who are actually building these facilities is you have to make sure that you're actually considering all three of these drivers and you need to be considering them in context. You can't just assume that one country will be the same as another or even different districts or different schools. You need to make sure that for the users you're designing for, you think about all three of these things. And Finally, just what Hannah and I have done, we, this is a journal article that you can access, it's open access, um, but we've also created this summary, which is just one page back and front, um, giving a, a brief idea of the results. But most importantly, this red box on the front, which is the recommendation of what we really think that anyone who is thinking of designing um, menstrual disposal or washing facilities needs to have front of mind. And we were hoping that would be useful for some of you in terms of actually um, going to donors or going to just other people in your organization and saying, well, let's make sure that we incorporate this going forward. Uh, it's my 10 minutes up. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the rest of the speakers. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, that was great. Uh, really, really well done to compress so much information in such a short time. Um, and so clear how important it is to have those linkages among the different factors that affect behavior. Um, so thank you for that, that clear presentation. And um, now we're gonna turn to Y Labs and their work on understanding disposal. Um, so Ali Beeman and Joe Kiswiga, please uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Nancy. Hi everyone, my name is Ali Beeman. I'm a research analyst here at Y Labs, and this is my colleague. I'm Joseph Kosiga, and I'm a senior product designer at Y Labs. Will Ali take over? Perfect, thank you, Joe. So today we'll be quickly sharing with you an overview of our findings from two studies. We did an exploratory study named Project Flow, and then as well the pilot results from the Cocoon Mini Project. Both of these studies were conducted in the Bidi Bidi settlement located in Northern Uganda, and just for some specific context, uh, the settlement is currently home to around 240,000 refugees, 80% whom are South Sudanese asylum seekers that are uh, displaced uh, as a result of war. So in the research, our problem and design statement were as followed, is that limited access to menstrual health products and supplies, along with safe private spaces for disposal, is a pressing problem for menstruators in humanitarian crisis. Specifically within Project Flow, which I'll be discussing first, um, we sought to explore the current behaviors, needs, and challenges related to menstrual health uh, product disposal and the user's preferences and bar barriers uh, to these different disposal mechanisms. This research was conducted through a rapid literature review, interviews with 15 global experts in various sectors, of which many are here today, so thank you again, um, and as well as 15 in-depth interviews with menstruators themselves. So first, I just want to dive into why does disposal matter at all? From our interviews and literature review, we identified four primary negative um, outcomes or impacts. First is the physical health risks caused by overuse of menstrual products beyond their intended time. When a menstruator can't find disposal options, they tend to overuse their products and this can cause uh, UTIs as well as rashes. Another impact is the potential loss for income and educational opportunities as a result of inadequate wash facilities in schools and workplaces. Menstruators tend to avoid these areas as there's no place to wash or change. 
Uh, third are the environmental impacts um, that can be caused by improper disposal, such as burning or burying by the user that can release harmful gases and impact other uh, life forms. And finally, there's the psychological stress and anxiety, social trauma and shame that are consequences of menstruation, but are exacerbated uh, without, uh, with inadequate disposal options. So one of our main findings that really serves as a framework for all of the rest of our results is that menstrual waste disposal falls within this larger ecosystem that not only includes disposal decisions by the menstruator, but as well as the product choice and usage, which are all interlinked and driven by what we call menstrual management. These are the cultural beliefs, practices, stigma, taboo uh, that bring about shame and fear and psychological stress onto the menstruators. Often this means that menstrual management is governing the types of products that they're using, how they use their products and how they ensure their disposal. So we identified six typical methods that people who menstruate use to dispose of their products, depending on their cultural context and product type. They include both user-driven mechanisms such as burning or burying, as well as system-driven approaches, um, such as dropping your product in a waste bin, for example, or into a pit latrine in some cases. And the time in which they dispose of their products also varies, but we found that many menstruators will even put themselves at risk in order to dispose of their products at night in order to not be seen. So from our interviews with menstruators, we found common challenges um, to disposal, such as in particular with burning pads, it's not seen as a straightforward approach. Mostly pads need to be dried out beforehand. And this was not seen as a trusted process as often you would have to leave your pad out um, to be dried and that increase the chances of being seen by men or children. The number one most common way of disposal we found was uh, throwing your product in a pit latrine. This was believed to offer the most discretion and confidentiality. However, menstruators were also very deeply scared that their products would resurface as the pit latrine uh, filled and that they would be blamed by the community members themselves. But no matter what type of disposal method menstruators were using, they had a deep fear, anxiety, and stress that their used products would be found and used for witchcraft. And in some cases, um, thought to be uh, that they would become barren if men saw their products as well. So in this quote, one participant said, I feel scared of disposing pads when many people are at home. Away from home, there's no better place to dispose of pads. I could dispose of pads in the bush, but that also makes me feel ashamed. So another critical finding that we found is that privacy needs to extend beyond the individual and the space that they're disposing in, but to the use uh, products themselves. So disposal needs to be discreet and final, meaning that menstruators wish to leave no discoverable trace of their menstrual blood or products, and that a product is not disposed of until it's completely out of sight and inaccessible now or in the future as well to both men, children, and even animals. Um, and then finally, we have crafted six design principles that every disposal system needs to incorporate or think about. First, uh, is for a successful design, one, um, sh it should be menstruator led, reflecting the local preferences, beliefs about menstruation. And we highly encourage uh, doing this by co-designing with participants. Our findings also indicated that a system-based approach is needed here, that you need both the hardware, meaning the infrastructure, as well as the software interventions, such as the social behavioral interventions with a particular focus and stigma reduction to see uh, long-term success. Disposal systems also need to be compatible with existing regional and national waste management systems rather than function as a standalone point of disposal technology. And that all disposal systems need to reassure the user of complete eradication of the blood um, and product. And that this needs to be a trusted process uh, through administrators. Disposal facilities also need to provide the user with privacy and security. And this can be done through lights, locks, um, things like that. And finally, we also recommend that disposal systems can function with low upfront capital requirements, low, on coast, low cost ongoing maintenance, and have a mechanism for cost recovery. Thanks, Ali. Um, to address some of the issues faced by the administrators in Y Labs piloted the Cocoon Mini, and that's a semi permanent latrine and bathing area that was built within household compounds in Bitty Bitty and is accessible to families in the surrounding area. And it was estimated that this project was able to serve roughly about 300 administrators throughout its three month pilot. So the mini features high privacy walls and locking doors, um, both in latrine and shelter, 
Um, and dedicated disposal areas for sanitary products were added to the space. The disposal bin also serves as a drying bin for used and disposed uh, sanitary products, which help prepare used products for efficient burning as that's the most common and available me method of disposal in the settlement. The mini also features a water access point in its immediate vicinity and portable solar lights were added to provision uh, each site. And of the 20 units built, two communities were constructed for exclusive use by menstruators, which had chutes and incinerators installed to provide means of final on-site disposal. Um, so a menstruator had remarked that the cocoon mini has helped me because I no longer dispose of use pads in the bush as usual, since the mini spaces are all over the villages. So I got a comment from the increase in infrastructure there. So when we pilots, uh, when we have concluded, we were able, able to highlight some of the factors that alleviated administrators' daily disposal challenges. First, the product was able to directly integrate and facilitate feedback from administrators according to their needs. Um, second, the ability to easily access a nearby water source made administrators feel like they were able to manage their menstrual cycle and health uh, with increased ease and provide them more options for maintaining reusable menstrual products. Uh, third, menstruators were able to wash, change, and dispose of the used products at their convenience. And those solar lights we provided also improved menstruators' ability to access the Cocoon Mini and its features even at night. Fourth, the Cocoon Mini also increased menstruators' access to female-friendly facilities throughout their community, as mentioned before in that quote, which in turn enhanced the likelihood of menstruators being able to properly dispose of their products. And fifth, in the three months the Cocoon Mini sites were in use, there was no safety incidents involved in, um, uh, reported. And administrators expressed an increase in safety and security using the sites, factors like locks on doors, disposal bins, privacy walls, and support from community supervisors and leaders contributed to this. Um, by far, incinerators were the biggest expense per unit uh, in the project. However, we learned that the two incinerators that we did install were used by more than just the two units they were provisioned to. We had reports of other supervisors transporting um, dried pads from their units to the incinerators for final disposal. So really not every site or area needs to have an incinerator, but the investment in additional disposal options and methods and infrastructure proved to be greatly desired and needed in the settlement. So how can the disposal ecosystem be improved? Poorly designed and maintained disposal systems are an underdressed barrier to menstruators effectively managing their cycles. And future investment and development is needed to create dignified, sustainable, and safe disposal systems in low and middle income countries and humanitarian contexts. And here are recommendations for future work in the disposal ecosystem. Uh, we need to improve disposal systems and their associated norms in partnership with menstruators and non-menstruating people by utilizing participatory methods and including them in the design process in order to explore opportunities for socially supportive and inclusive interventions in low and middle income contexts. We also need to develop a deeper understanding of the disposal ecosystem by conducting user research with waste pickers, these ledgers, and other waste management system stakeholders on their needs and current constraints. Uh, for future work and interventions should also look to explore additional pathways for financial sustain, uh, sustainability. The research and testing of opportunities for income generation and incentivized disposal solutions can benefit the community and improve adoption and sustainability. And finally, menstrual waste disposal is not just a waste management sector issue. It requires a multi-sectoral approach. And in order to address menstruators' disposal needs holistically, there needs to be a cross-collaboration with the WASH, waste management, and sexual reproductive and health rights sectors. This would not only address the infrastructure needs, but also the educational and social behavioral needs that often are sidelined. Um, so with that said, uh, thank you very much. And I know I said a lot there, but we do have a lot of materials that outline more what the projects like we just outlined there were. Um, but thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ali and Joe. That was great. And seems like a lot of, um, a lot of crossover with, with Danny's presentation about the importance of linking various sectors and of also of the voice of the user um, that came out loud and clear. So um, it's, it's very cool to hear some of these examples of on the ground activities um, and how they manifested, how, how they were accepted. Um, so just a reminder, I think, I don't know, I think the poll is closed. We'll share that after the end of the next presentation. Um, and now I'd like to invite um, Emily Cruz from Splash to 
uh, present the work that uh, Splash has done in India and Ethiopia. Great, thanks so much, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Emily Cruz and I'm the Senior Global Lead for Menstrual Health at Splash. And today I'm going to be sharing uh, some landscape findings from research that we did on menstrual, menstrual waste management in schools in India and Ethiopia. So um, I just wanna start by kind of or laying out the vision for Splash's menstrual health program. As I mentioned, we work in schools and we are hoping to transform the physical and social environment to empower girls so that they can manage their menstruation with dignity. And what we found is that physical and social environment are both intricately linked to disposal practice. So as you can see, we have a very comprehensive intervention that includes curricula, uh, puberty workshops for boys, peer mentoring, digital tools, and then of course, comprehensive infrastructure. And that's kind of the main channel that we use to improve disposal practices. So in this uh, beautiful mock-up of a splash bathroom, you'll see that um, in number five, we have install features that uh, support disposal, and that is primarily the inclusion of trash bins so that girls are able to dispose of their products within the stall um, with discretion so that, um, as you've heard from the other presenters, their menstrual status is not known to their peers um, and people within the school. So for our menstrual waste, land menstrual waste landscape in India, we started with a policy landscape and we really wanted to understand how policy was driving school level behaviors. And what we found is that there are a lot of gaps. So um, we found that there is guidance for provision of certain uh, disposal infrastructure without any uh, means to enforce it. Um, there's often guidance for product manufacturers to include disposal bags, but again, lack of enforcement of that and definitely lack of consistent standards across different product types. Um, menstrual waste is often categorized as either dry waste or biomedical waste across different types of policies, and that results in inconsistent handling of menstrual waste and often um, integration of waste within uh, other types of waste, so that causes uh, safety issues for sanitary workers. Um, we also found that uh, it's often recommended that girls be the ones to um, make sure that their product is disposed of properly without the education for the girls on how to do that. So a lot, of, a lot of gaps in the policy landscape, but it is nice to see that menstrual waste is being addressed. Um, you know, Previously before 2015 in India, this wasn't something that was addressed at all within the policy landscape. Um, so there's just a lot of work to be done in that space. Um, we talked to girls and administrators within the schools and we found that a large challenge was that there was just too much waste within the schools and not enough um, support from janitorial staff to collect that waste. So bins were often overflowing and janitors were requiring extra payment to handle menstrual waste because there's a lot of stigma around touching the waste of a, another menstruator. Um, so they would often refuse to collect that waste and dispose of it. Um, school administrators you know, were very appreciative to Splash for coming in and building these amazing uh, sanitation blocks, but they said that it just wasn't enough to address the menstrual waste disposal uh, challenges that they were facing. Girls felt really strongly that the state of their bathrooms was a reflection of the student body and their values. And um, the school administrators also echoed this and really wanted to find solutions. And we saw a lot of school level solutions that were very creative and I'm excited to share more about those. Um, so one of them being on this picture on the left, you can see these newspapers and they're kind of hung in a stall using like a kind of like a coat hanger. And these newspapers are used by menstruators to wrap their pads to put into the bins. And this was in hopes to uh, conceal the pad, protect the janitors from touching any menstrual waste um, and hopefully improving the, you know, the cleanliness of the bathrooms overall. So that was led by a child cabinet at one of the schools and child cabinets are kind of the hygiene ambassadors um, at schools within Kolkata. Um, we also worked on providing the right size of menstrual waste bins at schools. So we had bins within the stalls, we had bins outside of the stalls, and then we had a larger receptacle as a collection point um, kind of outside of the bathroom, but on school grounds. Um, we also really wanted to think through, you know, the ultimate disposal of these products. And so we tested out different incinerators. And luckily in the India market, there are really 
fantastic options for electrical incinerators, which have a lower emissions production and um, lower ash production when burning products. And then the last thing that we tried to do at schools was raise awareness about the different types of products. So reusable products and then also biodegradable products so that it wasn't this huge production of disposable products, um, you know, all girls schools with 5,000 students, you know, all within secondary school uh, age, you know, they're all menstruating. That's a lot of menstrual waste for schools to be managing. Um, so from our electrical incinerator trial, we found that there was a lot of um, success in reducing that menstrual waste load, uh, but there were a lot of um, barriers that we were facing. So girls were afraid to use the incinerators because they thought they would be electrocuted or that they would um, be burned because of course incineration, they think high temperature. And they were also really concerned about breaking uh, the product. So we created these posters that you see on the left and they were posted next to the incinerators within the stalls and we did behavior change campaigns uh, led by the child cabinets to kind of instruct their fellow students on how to use the incinerators. Um, often the electrical incinerators that are provided to schools or provided to um, there's electrical incinerators and train stations and things like that commercially available, they become defunct because of improper use. Uh, they get broken, they are overused, um, and there's not a, an operation and maintenance strategy in place. So we wanted to make sure that we were addressing that by engaging the manufacturer of the incinerator to routinely check in on their products within the schools to ensure that they weren't breaking. Um, the last barrier was at the community level. Of course, any incinerator, even if it's burning at 800 degrees Celsius and like checking all the boxes for um, the really high quality standards, it's still gonna produce some smoke and there's a need for venting. And that venting will produce the, the smoke with smoke within to the community. And so communities were kind of um, pushing back on the incinerators being installed within schools. Um, and then for Addis Ababa, a very different landscape, a lot of different constraints, um, but a lot of the core issues still at the root um, of the disposal practices there for students. So the policy landscape in Addis, we found that menstrual waste was not categorized in a consistent way across guidelines again and that schools were being directed to find solutions for their menstrual waste for their students. And in Ethiopia, the schools are even larger than some of the schools that we found in Kolkata. So a lot of students. Um, and they, they kind of were not provided clear guidance on what to do with their students' uh, menstrual waste. And so what often happened was it was being mixed in the other dry waste and either burned on site, on site or disposed of through micro enterprise uh, trash collectors as mixed waste. Um, and then it also kind of recommended that schools uh, dispose of their menstrual waste using incineration. That was something that came up a lot throughout the guidelines. But again, there wasn't a lot of clear guidelines on the emission standards, the performance criteria, um, what to do with ash after the incineration. And then within the Ethiopia market, there are not any uh, electrical incinerators available. So these are all manual incinerators that burn at a lower temperature and produce more emissions. The school level challenges are similar to those in Kolkata, but have you know a couple more nuances. We found that waste bins were very often stolen. So we provided a lot of waste bins to the schools and we found that every six months, Splash was having to go back in and provide more bins because um, they were you know nice plastic bins with lids that kind of you know would flip so that the trash was very contained. Um, and then, when those bins were stolen, the girls would then just throw their menstrual waste down the latrine. Um, and that's something that the other speakers also shared was kind of an, a primary uh, behavior of wanting to get rid of the products but discreetly. So latrine drains were very often being, being clogged. Um, and again, there's no citywide guidelines on the proper menstrual waste management and schools were being asked to hire micro enterprises to come and collect their trash. And, each micro enterprise would collect trash or waste on an inconsistent basis using different methods and with the, the menstrual waste being mixed in with the other dry waste. So this is kind of a, a snapshot of what the schools look like um, prior to the splash intervention and where the menstrual waste often lands. This is a drain just outside of um, one of the sanitation blocks. 
And girls were really frustrated. They didn't want to use the bathrooms because menstrual waste was all over the floors. And um, they very often would leave school campuses to manage their menstruation so that they didn't have to deal with, you know, the dirty uh, bathrooms that no longer worked because they were clogged. And that was something that Splash is really focused on reducing. We want girls to be staying at school for the whole day. Uh, they often would come to school during their periods, but then leave, you know, when they needed to change their product or they wouldn't change their product frequently enough resulting in rashes and reproductive tract infections. So this is just a quick diagram of the current practice. As I mentioned, MH waste was being thrown away with other dry waste and either was burned openly on site or it was mixed in with other trash collected by these micro enterprises and then was um, addressed within landfills by sanitary workers as mixed waste, which is of course um, dangerous for those workers. And then our ideal, what we're trying to implement is making sure there's always bins and stalls, collecting the menstrual waste into a specific container on the school site. So um, in like a biohazard container that says very clearly this is menstrual waste and it can include other biohazard waste as well. Um, and then providing these higher quality manual incinerators because like I said, uh, electrical incinerators are not available on the Ethiopia market. And, importing them is incredibly expensive. So that was kind of cost prohibitive for um, a citywide scaled intervention because of course Splash is working in every government school within Addis Ababa and Kolkata. So that's a lot of incinerators to provide. Um, and then if the incinerator is not on site, then we want to support schools to hire the right microenterprise partners to collect the trash and then manage it um, at the landfill sites. So this is just a a little uh, graphic of the incinerator model that we are promoting among schools and trying to build capacity for them to have constructed. And we work with the government of Addis Ababa to um, do all of our site level infrastructure. So we've handed them our standards of what we think would be appropriate for schools and the construction of manual incinerators. We're gonna be doing a feasibility and acceptability assessment of these manual incinerators. And we wanna look at frequency of use, user type, operations, maintenance, and all of those different factors that drive the, um, the effectiveness of a manual incinerator within schools. We also wanna look at other types of institutions that are using manual incinerators and learn from their experiences because of course we see a lot of historical experience with incineration and autoclaving at you know, health facilities um, and hospitals. So we wanna learn from their experiences and how they maintain their infrastructure for disposal of, of biohazard waste or menstrual waste. Um, we also know that there's a couple other organizations, nonprofits that are working on addressing menstrual waste disposal within Addis. And we're so happy to have partners such as WaterAid and um, a couple other groups that are trying to address this issue as well. So we wanna learn with them and co-fund uh, different solutions and. Um, really address these challenges for the students because it is kind of like the, the ultimate challenge for um, menstrual waste management at schools is we can address all the stigma and the cultural issues and the knowledge and the lack of or the access to products, but disposal is that like end piece that is just missing right now. So it's a primary focus for Splash. So that is a high level overview of the landscape for menstrual waste management in Kolkata and in Ethiopia. And um, I will be sharing uh, two white papers, hopefully with this group in the next day or so that kind of go into more detail about this research. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. It was, it was a pleasure to present. Thank you so much, Emily. That was great. This has just been such a rich set of um, information that's been presented to us. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I know I have, I have questions that I've, I've seen a couple come through the chat um, and one specifically, uh, Emily, was around who maintains the bathrooms in the splash. I think it was in the India example. Um, can you can you speak to that? Yeah. So when Splash starts working with a school, we have them sign like an MOU that kind of guarantees that the school will commit to budgeting for janitorial staff. There aren't janitors um, that are always hired within the school system in Kolkata. That's different in Addis. In Addis, there's always what's called like a sweeper or a cleaner and they are paid by the government. So it was easy to create a janitorial program, a behavior change program in Addis, but in Kolkata, there was kind of that extra step of having to make sure schools are budgeting for those um, 
those staff members and that they also are comfortable addressing the menstrual waste challenges. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, there's just so many things that, that came up in your presentation that also did reflect some of the others. Um, the, the issue about um, kind of who's responsible overall and how you categorize the waste. You know, uh, the, the biohazardous waste designation, which came up, I think, in India and maybe also in Ethiopia. Um, it just, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, piece of this puzzle, which uh, deserves a lot more attention of how the waste is categorized. And actually, in our um, follow-up uh, webinars we're going to have um, in the next couple of months, there will be one on the role of systemic stakeholders and emerging solutions. So we'll be able to look at some of the these aspects of it. Today we're focusing more on the behavioral, but um, it's uh, it's it's a they're they're all related, of course. Um, and the challenges of incineration that you raise are such real ones that I'm certainly familiar with in the world of healthcare waste management, and um, and 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 the fact that uh, as the other presenters said. Uh, there's such a strong desire by menstruators in many places to have the waste completely gone, to know that nobody can tamper with it, that it's gone. It's not going to resurface. So um, it's, it is a challenge with the waste management piece. I think you know, many of us who would not want to see incinerators in place um, are challenged by how do you get rid of this waste completely. And I know that there's work that we'll be looking at in these future webinars on on composting and that sort of thing, but there are, there are, are big challenges with many of these things as well, that, um, especially for the lower levels of, of management. So it's, it really speaks to some of the, the, the big um, issues that are facing uh, systems and schools where there are such high numbers, as you said, in both India and Ethiopia, high numbers of uh, high amounts of waste being produced. Um, and the lack of standards, lack of emission standards uh, for these kinds of uh, incinerators, and especially a kind that could be affordable. It also just seems like there's such a need for integration with the broader waste management ecosystem and systems that menstrual waste doesn't, you know, doesn't have to be treated as a standalone, as a separate um, aspect. Uh, these are just some kind of questions for us to be thinking about. Um, I'd like to uh, right now turn to Madison and see Madison if you could share the um, results of the first poll before we start the second one. Absolutely. All right, so I should be sharing the results. Um, so you should be able to see those on your screen now. Yes. So it <clears throat> looks like from the sectors, the, the, the thematic areas, a sexual reproductive health um, and WASH were the primary ones with gender equity and other, which I don't know what that represents being um, the next most. So uh, yeah, interesting, sexual reproductive health, which is encouraging and the WASH sector, um, but also some from climate action, sustainability and education. So just representing how broad this issue is. That's great. And this, is that the second one? Yep. Yeah, that uh, question number two, but I can uh, share our second poll if we are ready. Yeah, I think so. You should be able to see the second questionnaire. You can please fill in those two questions. Great, and you'll leave this on for how long, Madison? Uh, just a little while until it looks like we've received, um, you know, a large number, a large percentage of participants, and it's growing pretty quick. We're at about fifty percent. We're almost at fifty percent now. Excellent. Okay. Um, we'll share that uh, after the, the panelists probably. Mm -hmm. So um, now I'd like to turn to our, um, our panelists who joined the call, uh, who are looking at this from some different perspectives uh, and have expertise in menstrual waste management um, uh, from the donor perspective, from the humanitarian perspective, from the more of the, the bigger picture. 
So I'd like to um, ask uh, uh, David um, Clatworthy from IRC. Uh, David, if you could tell us a bit about how you would describe the challenges to safe disposal and waste management in the humanitarian context from the perspective of the beneficiaries and of humanitarian actors. Yeah, hi, Nancy, thanks. Um, I think we've had some great, uh, you know, the presentations have already spoken to that a lot, I think, especially from the beneficiary side, and there's been really, um, yeah, it's been a very interesting presentation. Thanks, everyone. Um, maybe talking briefly about from the, as a humanitarian wash actor, though, uh, sort of that perspective in a humanitarian emergency, I think we tend to look at it from a public health perspective. And we tend to look at it from an engineering perspective. We're certainly concerned about disease vectors and so on. And just bearing in mind that often humanitarian emergencies are really large in scale and under budgeted. And I think, and Nancy, you were talking about this a bit earlier that the standards are not, it's not an easy problem to solve anyway. Um, you know, the sort of, I'm talking about, about waste in general, solid waste in general, not specifically about menstrual waste at this point. You know, that the sort of lined landfills that we, that we see in Western cities are really expensive and, you know, not really practical in a, in a refugee camp or similar. And the alternatives like burying or burning or even incineration are problematic in various ways. So it's not an easy problem to solve in the first place. And then, um, you know, on top of that, menstrual waste obviously has the, the stigma and taboos and so on. Um, I think that probably thinking about the perspective of beneficiaries, you know, I think one thing we can agree on is that disposing at the, the immediate point of disposal is not usually the final point. And, you know, women and girls are, you know, obviously the sanitation workers have to figure out how to get it from the bin to the final disposal point, usually, unless it is dis um, destroyed on site. Uh, women and girls are also really worried about, or you know, menstruators are also often really worried about their process. They want to know, as we've heard a bit before, you know, what happens to their pad after it's been disposed and, you know, will people see it, et cetera. Uh, so maybe I'll leave it there, but yeah, it's a, there's, there's quite a difference in perspective, I would say. Yeah, thanks, David. That's, it's helpful. Just, it's, it's interesting to have this point reinforced over and over of, of how important it is to look at the individual steps, you know, how you get it from a disposal point to final disposal, um, final disposal and treatment, if that's the approach. Um, and that's that's critical for people for menstruators to be willing to dispose. So really addressing those issues, which I think all three presentations have highlighted so well. Um, and then a, a follow up question is: Is there a cost that is externalized to other actors when providers of menstrual products don't factor in the disposal and waste management of the products they distribute? Um, I would say, yeah, um, I'd say. Largely, no. I mean, I think that as you know, the the wash sector needs to be willing to, uh, you know, to address the needs of of menstruators in the camp or in in the humanitarian situation. And and so, if menstruators are using the menstrual materials that suit them best or that or, you know that make sense to them, then we need to find ways to dispose of that. So, I think that the you know those costs uh, should be built in. And um, on the other hand people distributing or organizations that are distributing products do need to be talking to the, you know, the sanitation sector, whether they're reusable or disposable, um, you know, the wash sector. And we, you know, we need to work the, these things out together. And also, of course, with, with the, the menstruators themselves as well. Uh, so it needs to be a three-way conversation, but each has a role to play. Yeah. Again, that importance of, uh, of involving the, the user and, yeah. and, considering the products that has such an impact on the ultimate disposal. Um, but yeah. then the systems, you have to have the systems, whatever type of product to manage them. So yeah, uh, just, I mean, I feel like this is really highlighting the, the, the critical aspect of that communication among the various partners and parties in this conversation. So a last question for you, David, um, what can humanitarian agencies do to influence menstrual waste disposal behaviors, actually, this is not the last question for you. So hang on. Uh, what can humanitarian okay. agencies do to influence menstrual waste disposal behaviors? And how does that fit into the successful or unsuccessful behavior change in WASH interventions? Yeah. Um, and I think probably designing systems that make sense is probably the most important part. You know, it needs to be discreet. It needs to be convenient. I think, you know, what we see is that if 
if the if the sanitation sector in the in a camp say again using camp as an example if they have an idea about how menstrual waste will be disposed of but if menstruators see perhaps a more convenient way such as you know disposing into a pit latrine given the taboos given the um you know everything that surrounds um you know menstrual waste people are going to do what's most discreet and what's most convenient for them you know they have fewer options in that so i think we need to make sure that we're not asking menstruators to do things that you know that don't make sense uh, uh, interventions need to be well designed and i think we've seen here good examples of the speeches in the um, talk so far and then it needs to be about uh, clear and sustained communication uh, and it needs to be two-way communication we, um, we tend to tell people what to do there's also you know power dynamics and gender dynamics often at play about you know telling telling women and girls what how they are to behave um, but and there's often an element of scolding and shaming that we see over and over again so yeah, it needs to be respectful, it needs to be two way, it needs to be clear and sustained. Uh, yeah, thanks. Are there, are there, do you have you seen examples of like committees and groups and camps of that involve the women, the menstruators, the women and the girls primarily, um, where they can put their voice into the solutions? Yeah, I think we have seen good examples of that in various places. Um, but often, you know, often on a fairly small scale, I would say. Um, I think it's harder to do that on a, you know, on a really large scale, but I mean, but that is still insightful in terms of understanding what's working and what's not working from the perspective of menstruators. Yeah, true. Scale is a big, big factor in this. Yes. Uh, the last question, can you share your thoughts on how successful interventions for disposal and well, and waste management could be scaled? And what do you foresee as potential challenges to mainstream it? A big question. Okay. Yeah, that is, because uh, I mean, I do think from the work that we've seen, you know, when we we're working on the MHM and emergencies toolkit, and then the um, compendium on waste disposal, waste management. Um, yeah, we, we saw some really promising pilots. Um, we didn't, we saw, I think, almost you know, very little um, really on the scale that was needed to, you know, for a population scale. So I think that's something that we really need to continue to work on. Um, probably the most important thing perhaps is when we do pilots, you know, sustaining the documentation and the study of that to really kind of see it through to the end and kind of prove success. Uh, you know, I think often humanitarian workers have quite short attention spans and staff moves on personnel change programs change and we don't really ever fully evaluate whether the pilot meets you know whether it's it is the right thing for the future i think we'd also need cost analysis as well that's always going to be a challenge um yeah and then uh yeah, scale is a challenge i mean we, we obviously need to have donors on board um solid waste management is just an ongoing cost which is not a particularly popular element of humanitarian response. So I think that all comes together, but maybe maybe I'll leave it there. Sure I'd love to hear from other people on the panel as well. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you so much, David. That was great. Um, I, I, yeah, if waste management is challenging, menstrual waste management and then in humanitarian settings, um, such, a, such a huge challenge. And it's good to hear you know, that there are some uh, important efforts being made as we've heard through the BDBD example of um, ways to manage it. Um, Francesca Mazzola, I would like to invite you um, next to, uh, to, to share some of your thoughts. Um, from a donor perspective, what do you see as the key funding priorities and the outstanding research and implementation issues for menstrual waste disposal and infrastructure? I know the Gates Foundation has been involved in this for over the years, um, and uh, it'd be great to know what, what, where things stand now and what you see as the priorities. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nancy. And thanks to everyone for, for being here and holding this space. It's such an exciting uh, time, I think, in this space and specifically to just hear from such wonderful work that's being done. At a very, very high level, I would say funders should do what Danny, uh, Emily, Ali, Joe, and David just told us to do. I think it is critical and David mentioned power dynamics more broadly, but I think you know that also exists in the funder relationship. I think we need to be working and listening to folks who are on the ground doing this work consistently. 
Um, but at a high level, I think funders also tend to conflate two things that I think are really critical to pull apart. One is research to understand the problem, and the second is implementation challenges. And we often assume that funding one means funding the other. I think both are critical. I think their funding uh, priorities vary slightly. So if you take research on funding the problem itself, while menstrual health and hygiene research and specifically research on menstrual waste and infrastructure has been limited, I think we're seeing in today's conversations that there are some key themes that are beginning to emerge. And critically, and I think super importantly, we are actually seeing the importance of doing this research and thinking about this research across different sectors. But the presentations did a phenomenal job of synthesizing, I think, some of the key themes uh, that we are seeing across disposal challenges. The foundation has also funded some additional studies that I'm happy to share, including an MHH landscape, which had a focus on disposal in 2016, 2018, a research study on disposal from NFSSM Alliance. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna reiterate what the folks already did an excellent job of doing, but there are several factors that affect disposal, including product choice, product usage, social norms, and disposal opportunities. That said, you know, we have themes. I think those are critical. I also want to double down that when funders are interested in funding a specific area or specific program, it is critical to validate and triangulate the challenges faced by menstruators in a specific context before moving to solution implementation. I think we can't say we, we figure this out and then move on. Um, for example, I'm currently working on a project in Nigeria. We commissioned, even you know, having those high-level landscapes, we commissioned a specific study within the country and saw very quickly nuanced differences across cultural, religious, social norms within Nigeria itself, right? Southern Nigeria, menstruators faced and shared many more fears around menstrual blood being used for witchcraft and taboos. In Northern Nigeria, much smaller concern. And so that affects how you think about program implementation. From an implementation perspective, I think there are several funding priorities and outstanding questions that I would highlight, several of which the speakers have mentioned already, but I'm gonna just double down. First and foremost, critical to understand that whenever you are considering menstrual health and hygiene, including disposal, it's a multi-sectoral, multifaceted approach, right? This is a complex topic. It's not just innovative products those play a role. It's not just better sanitation. That plays a role. It's not education alone that, you know, those stickers are not going to do everything, as Danny said. Uh, and so we need to consider both infrastructure, the hardware, as Y Labs call it, and social behavior, the software, and equally important, potentially more important, that those interventions are actually designed with users in mind. I, I think we're starting to see, probably because of the wonderful folks on this call, more of that push in understanding implementation, or sorry, understanding the problem. I think we need to see funders support that more critically as we think about funding the implementation. So to improve, for example, to improve disposal systems and norms, we need to find, we need to fund and find interventions that are shaped in partnership with menstruators, non-menstruators, and critical sanitation workers can't be a single faceted approach, right? We need to design for the entire system. Take Danny's example earlier of the incinerator. I think that's a great example of how we can fail. You know, I think we need to one, explore and test improvements to disposal systems using participatory methods with menstruators. That's critical. But you also need to conduct sessions with non-menstruating people to explore opportunities for socially supportive software interventions. And you need to understand the disposal ecosystem. So conducting user research with public toilet workers, waste pickers, just sludgers, you know, to David's point, the first point of disposal is usually not the last. And so if, unless you're looking across all three, you're really not going to get to a solution that is sustainable or scalable. Um, and that is something that I also think funders need to take uh, a specific eye towards. Pilots just aren't going to cut it when we're trying to think about whole scale work. All right, I will stop because you can you can probably tell I can talk for a long time. It's great. It's great to hear you talk for a long time about this. It, it's music to I'm sure many of our ears. Um, uh, yeah, and I think you hit on such important points uh, that and, and as David did also the whole issue of scale and and that in conjunction with what you said at the beginning about the differences in context. 
So it's like, it's a, it's a challenge to look at how do you address the specific context while also scaling. Um, and, and I think that's a, it sounds like there's, there's interest and appetite for looking at something that does try to take it beyond a pilot, you know, and, and does work with across sectors, which would be such an exciting thing to see. Um, so that sounds really hopeful. Uh, I, Francesca, a second question for you. Do donors have a role in galvanizing the private sector to address the challenges of menstrual waste disposal that a menstruator faces from both the product and the system side? Oh, Nancy, this is such a good question. And it's a hard one, but I'm gonna say absolutely. So philanthropy can play many roles in better understanding and overcoming social challenges, but it alone does not have enough resources or reach to really solve everything or, or sometimes anything. Um, so I think partnership with the private sector is a huge opportunity, especially in including around menstrual waste disposal, to think about both that sustainability and scalability piece. Um, we've increasingly seen funders work in partnership with the private sector to galvanize new approaches to social challenges broadly. Right, so there are three that I would highlight. There's reconceiving products needs for, for not served consumers. There's redefining the productivity uh, in value chain and there's enabling local cluster development. Specifically in menstrual waste disposal, I think there are significant opportunities for private sector partnerships. I'll give you two brief examples, one at the product level and one at the systems level. From a product level, I'm actually working right now with the private sector to prioritize uh, disposal in product development and testing. So we're currently working with a large multinational company to develop and test an innovative menstrual product for underserved menstruators in Nigeria. So to that earlier, earlier qualitative example, our role as the funder here has really been to support the company in thinking about a new business line, specifically thinking about how they can move away from business as usual, right? Their usual product is for the top of the pyramid. It is a disposable high luxury product. What we're pushing them to do is really understand the nuanced differences of the focused consumer segment that we are trying to reach together. And one of the largest pieces of feedback, uh, not surprising for anybody on this call that we saw in their user research was really the need to prioritize and think differently about disposal and specifically what that means in terms of the specific context, social norms and taboos related to menstrual blood. So while we're still in the refining prototypes, this user uh, feedback had a direct input on the type of product that we're exploring. So we actually thought we were going to have a disposal product. We are at a reusable product. And the foundation has been a critical partner, right? Like this or this company probably wouldn't be doing this product without our funding. Um, but we're moving to the market test. And if it's successful and fingers crossed, and we think all points, all signs point to it being successful, when our funding ends at the end of this year, we anticipate that this company will not only continue to sell within Nigeria, but actually expand to other countries as well. From a systems perspective, the answer is much more complicated. You know, candidly, we haven't cracked the code on this and various models are still being tested and explored in context. Unlike some utilities like water that people sometimes are more willing to pay for, Folks are often less inclined to pay for disposal, especially if there is a place, either a specific part of an informal settlement or a specific part of town that they themselves can go throw stuff away. And so the foundation has tried to tackle the financial sustainability component of sanitation systems, including MHH disposal through the citywide inclusive sanitation initiative through this work we're working. Through this work, we are working with the public sector, specifically utilities and municipalities to prioritize sanitation investment and service provision for all. The private sector has a role to play, it really does, but ultimately for the sanitation to be sustainable, we believe that governments need to play a role. So that's one place. In our transformation or transformative technologies portfolio, the foundation has funded the research and development of the so-called reinvent the toilets and is working with the private sector to catalyze and commercialize this at scale. It's our intention that the market will take over distribution and scaling of toilets, selling both directly to consumers who can afford them as well as to governments uh, who can provide them at subsidized uh, service basis for, for poor communities, but we don't have a, a, a secret sauce there. We, we hope there is one though. 
yeah, we do too. <laughs> that's uh, that's great information. I really appreciate all that in, insight into the things that the foundation is working on and, and prioritizing and thinking about. Um, the example of the product and the private sector is really encouraging and, and uh, yeah, it feels very hopeful because it feels like it does address the things we were talking about before of working across sector and taking the user input very much into consideration. Um, so that's that's great. And as you say, the systems perspective is is harder. That is a harder, much harder thing. And it's great that we're all thinking about it and talking about it. And um, and that's where, you know, when there's energy put into something, something comes out of it. So uh, it's I feel like there's some hope in what you've said, even though no immediate answers, perhaps. Um, thank you, Francesca. Uh, I'd like to move to um, Lawrence West uh, with the, the UK Foreign Commonwealth, Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, Lawrence, thank you so much for joining us. And a couple of uh, things. First, I wanted to just uh, say before I ask you the question, um, bilateral and multilateral donors have in recent years increased their requirements around the sustainability carbon footprint and environmental impact of humanitarian and development programs. In 2021, ECHO introduced binding requirements that will apply to all its humanitarian funding calls. So with that in mind, um, and recognizing that menstrual uh, health and uh, hygiene is a cross-cutting issue that requires multiple sectors to align their programming, on disposal and waste management alone, this requires offering a choice of a range of quality menstrual products, ensuring infrastructure is available and safe waste treatment sites are in place. How does FCDO ensure that its grantees provide an integrated approach to meeting the needs of menstruators and the environment? Great, thanks Nancy and such uh, to all of the other panelists and presenters and everyone here today. Um, so, we at FCDO very much believe that um, uh, we need to enable girls and women and, and everyone who menstruates to, to manage their, their periods safely, hygienically and with dignity. Um, and this allows them to stay in school, to participate in society and increase health and educational outcomes as well as economic freedom. And we support this through different aspects of our programming and particularly in key policy areas such as health, women and girls, and our science, data, technology, and innovation streams. And innovation plays a really important role. And it's through this that we're able to support a range of programs that focus on both research and also product development. And it's critical that we're able to continue to conduct research and increase the effectiveness and ultimately the quality of our programming, as well as also fill key product gaps. However, I think it would be of an error of me to not comment that there are also many solutions out there that already exist and we've seen these from some of the presenters already today but we must really challenge ourselves to do better and we must take the solutions which are out there and take them to scale we must also look at what the remaining gaps are and i'm very grateful to uh, our, our friends at splash who highlighted the policy gaps as well in this area um, so whilst we recognize the importance of menstrual hygiene management and programming, we also need to do, to do more to make sure it's applied properly in humanitarian responses. And this means that we can do more ourselves and we can also support our partners to do more with the solutions that exist already, the new innovations and some of the gaps that exist. And I think the first way that we need to do this is just to recognize that MHM is an integral part and a basic part of programming. It's not an add-on or a nice to have or something else. And we must recognize it also as an intersectoral issue, something that covers at least um, uh, health and wash, education and protection. And once it's recognized in our, our programming, we also need to, to appear in proposals and budgets and monitoring plans, because this is how we show that it's recognized and how we make sure that funds are actually allocated to these challenges. After this, we need to make sure that we have adequately experienced staff and that we're able to consult with women and girls uh, at all stages of the program cycle. And finally, that we can then kind of develop and consolidate these learnings and share them with others. So in terms of waste and the environment, I think it's also really important that women and girls have an appropriate choice of products that meet their needs. This is the first and most important thing. 
but then also that we were able to promote different options within that mix, which are either reusable or biodegradable, and that they're alongside facilities which mitigate all of the challenges that the other presenters have spoken about in terms of disposal. But reusable options are also cost effective, and we should consider this when we think about protracted crisis, as well as also the, the environmental impact. So I think when we consider disposal, the first thing we need to know is if the facilities are household facilities or communal or schools or otherwise, and then how we can link into waste disposal streams or whether we need a dedicated service to chain. And either way, the system needs to be really clear, it needs to be really safe, it needs to meet, meet different local needs at the time, then and in the future, as we spoke around some of the fear and social shame around this as well. Um, and that in each case, we need to ensure there's adequate consultation and that we're looking across the different sectors, as we said with this, because this is the basis of programming so that we can have uh, um, and a better understanding of social stigmas, of perceptions, and also start to address the, the shortages and gaps in knowledge. And once these options and service change are planned, it's then we can start looking also at the facilities that we have safe, safe disposal, that we have places to wash, dry, reusable materials, etc. And that all these, are, these facilities have a proper planning and upkeep and monitoring them, because otherwise they will, as other presenters have said, fall into disrespect quite quickly. Um, personally, I'd like to see an increase in the local manufacture of high quality products. And this means that we have more choices which are more appropriate for people and needs on the local market, but it also reduces the environmental impact of moving goods across the world, as well as supporting local economies. So I think as our role in this as a donor, we need to first of all support the system to recognize the importance of the issue, and I'm very glad that we have so many people participating here today and also then to standardize it in programming to make sure that we have budget lines around it. And then we can look at increasing the quality of programming through our partners, including the development of technical guidance, the funding of innovation and research into gaps. And ultimately this will hopefully increase the quality of the humanitarian response for women and girls, uh, whilst also reducing the environmental impact. Thanks. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, that was very, very, uh comprehensive and broad. And I think some of the things you said that really uh, spoke to me were the importance of appearing in proposal budgets and monitoring and really integrating menstrual health and hygiene into, you know, broadly, uh, because that's what we we know is that it is cross cutting. It, it is in so many sectors. And that's been one of the challenges because nobody owns it. But the fact that it does touch so many areas, you know, that would be really a huge step forward if it you know to have it recognized and included as like what are you doing in in your project for menstrual uh, uh, waste management menstrual health and hygiene in general but waste management in particular in this case um and and as you said the policy gaps that are just a broad uh, issue that need to be uh have a lot more attention put to um and then your comments about existing solutions and the importance of looking at reusable products and some of the more environmentally um, friendly approaches to managing waste, which, uh, you know, reusable products help address that. But also, I think even with disposables, if, as we, you know, take in in the bottom line to what are the costs of the things that we're doing um, and and then build that into proposal thinking, um, you know, how can we address these issues without it adding more damage to the environment. You know, what are creative ways that we can we can solve these problems? Because if we put our energy and our effort to it, there are ways. And as you said, people are coming up with some um, some workable, some good solutions. So thank you again so much for coming today. And we don't have much time left. And Arundhati, I'm so glad that you are here with us, um, and would love to have you uh, answer a couple of questions. Um, from your broad and deep perspective in menstrual health. Um, the first being, what are the considerations for menstrual health management programs from a behavior change perspective when tackling the issue of menstrual waste? And related to this, how does this differ for communities versus institutional settings, uh, i.e. you know, schools and workplaces? Um, so if you could speak to those issues. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to you, um, Tanya and Madison, for, for having me in this webinar to our great speakers. Um, so this is a this is a great question when we're looking at MHM programming. And 
Uh, oftentimes, I think when we're faced with these questions, I tend to go back to something that Tanya and I worked on, um, I think close to six or seven years ago, which is what we call the menstrual health and hygiene value chain. So um, even for behavior change, when we're looking at disposal and menstrual waste management solutions, we go back to the value change and identify where are those points of intersection that we begin to address this in the lens of our interventions, it's critical. Um, so our, our value chain looks at uh, you know, awareness and education on menstrual health and hygiene, as well as addressing inequitable gender norms, social norms that are impacting um, uh, menstruators and their ability to manage their menses. Um, the second one is looking at access to products. The third is looking at supporting hygienic use. And the, and the fourth one is to look at, at the actual disposal and waste management solutions. And the very first pillar of our value chain is where I think that we still have to put in considerable efforts. Because even from an awareness point of view, I think that we, we're we not doing a good enough job in our programs. Um, at least when I look at India and in South Asia, where, where, we, where we, have, we have more experience on this issue, um, is that talking to girls, women, and menstruators on what do you do with your product once you've used it? How do you dispose of it? So I think that that, that very first one where we're being able to provide uh, information and support on how do you safely dispose and then what happens to that waste down the waste value chain is I think a critical one. Second is that we're not linking waste management with products. Um, we, we tend at least in programs to look for a long time at these two things in silos. And um, through our interventions, we need to be able to connect um, the use of products with the disposal and waste management solutions. And here's what I think several of our speakers have alluded to this, the concept of an informed product choice approach uh, and knowing that there are different products that you can use um, that are good for you, you and your body and your context, but that also have implications for how you can dispose of these products. And, and that's the, the second big point. Um, the third big behavioral issue that we're, we're faced with, and, and again, I think speakers have alluded to it, but one that I'm feeling very acutely in the Indian context is on understanding and um, being able to engage in waste segregation. When we are looking at effective waste management, both at the user level and then downstream, when we're coming in contact with sanitation workers, cleaners, and then further downstream to people who will actually treat that waste, effectively segregating menstrual waste from other uh, types of waste that are generated at a household, institutional level, communal level becomes critical. And here's where I'm finding all of us struggle. Users, uh, we, we, we do struggle with segregating waste. It's not that easy. Um, it is a huge behavior change. We also see a lot of challenges in terms of having waste workers, sanitation workers, then collect segregated waste, maintain it in a segregated manner for downstream processing. Um, so I think a big area of, of need for programs, but also for research and policy uh, is to look at how do we um, effectively support the segregation of menstrual waste from other kinds of, of waste. Um, the, the second point that I want to raise, and I'm conscious of time, Nancy, is that when we're looking at behavior change and interventions, we also need to be looking at it from two perspectives. One is um, those of us who are the recipients of interventions. So girls and women and other people who menstruate and, and the ecosystem around them at that, that, that intervention delivery level. But the other group of stakeholders are the ones who are decision makers and policy makers um, whose behavior we also have to change when we're looking at menstrual waste. So how do we put menstrual waste on the map as an issue to be addressed in menstrual health and hygiene programming? How do we convince and change behaviors towards incorporating this as a part of larger solid waste and other type of waste management solutions that are being operationalized in rural and urban uh, areas? And, and very critically, I think, also looking at that link between products as well as, as waste management. Um, so I think that there is a range of other stakeholders um, uh, that we need to be engaging from this perspective. My last point, I think, on behavior and, and, and interventions on this issue is to look more closely at sanitation workers, waste workers, um, and anyone who's actually going to be, you know, like uh, immediately dealing with that waste uh, after users discard it. And this is a hugely, hugely I think, under, un, 
it, it's an underserved issue. We don't understand these behaviors enough. And, and it's a big call, I think, for all of us working on this issue to, to pay more attention to the health, dignity, safety, and the role of waste and sanitation workers in this. That's great, Arundhati. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I think it is critical. Um, and I think that it really brings up some of the, the cultural perspectives and differences that have to be considered in managing waste. How, what happens to it? Who handles it? Who is that interim person? And how does it impact them? And what do they do with it? So, you know, in the US, it ends up in a landfill. It's just all domestic waste, but that's not the case in many other places. And I think we have to really pay attention to what those cultural drivers are and what the, who the people are who are, you know, front line in handling this waste. Um, so that's a, that's a great call out along with your other points um, about the products and um, the implications of them uh, and, and the issue of segregation, which is a, a huge issue depending on where you are and how waste is handled. A last question in our last remote, oh gosh, we're out of time almost, but and you've sort of addressed it, but are there other stakeholders whose perspectives need to be kept in mind while looking at behavior change solutions for menstrual waste management? What is the status of evidence on this? So if you could just have, have a few <laughs> thoughts on that, that would be great. Very, very, very quickly, in addition to the ones, uh, sanitation workers, waste workers are one, but I think the second is to really look at um, those of, you know, there's a big group of private sector, but also manufacturers of various types of technologies uh, on waste solutions. So you, you have a range of incinerator manufacturers, but also entrepreneurs, innovators who are looking at alternative solutions for menstrual waste. And, and I think that we need to engage them more. I think we also need to understand the government's perspective on this and I just don't mean national governments but also local governments so whether you're in a city in a town in a rural area you have local government and they often have a role to play in waste management in several countries and I think that their roles responsibilities um, and how they're allocating budgets as well as human resources and other types of resources towards this issue needs to be to be addressed. Um, just one point, I think, the Nancy, I'm sorry, I forgot to answer your question on the difference between, um, I think you said institutions and, and households. And I think that there is actually a critical difference in waste management, which has a behavioral implication, but also one for, for the design of interventions. I find that when we have institutional settings, whether it's educational, formal work sites, healthcare facilities, um, there's almost like a in situ uh, disposal as well as treatment of waste, especially if you have incinerator facilities or other kinds of uh, solutions that are both aiding disposal plus final treatment. But where things get really complicated is when we're looking at community settings, community toilet settings, public toilet settings, um, because there you are disposing at one level, you're disposing off in your home, for example, but then there's a whole chain of events that need to happen outside of your home that take that to final uh, treatment. Um, and I think that's something that we are kind of wrestling with. We're trying to figure out how do you best deal with it? So I think it's a critical difference for us to consider. Thank you. Great, great call out on that. And I think that is true in all aspects of waste management or, or anything really, that final, final mile, last mile uh, is, uh, is a huge challenge. Um, thank you so much, Arundhati. Uh, I, I appreciate those of you who have been able to stay on. Um, Madison, do you have the poll uh, that you could share, the re results of the second poll? Um, sure. Absolutely. And as you do, I'd like to also just ask people, and remind people to put into the chat if you have any documents on waste management that you could share with us or send them to any of us that um, sent out this invitation for the, the webinar. We would be delighted to have them and to share them on our um, website. So prioritization of menstrual health supplies, waste management. Is it an existing priority? 80% say yes. That is amazing. Um, on the second question, on a scale of one to five, how high of a priority is menstrual waste management in your work? And it's a, it's a medium priority. It looks like high priority for 38% and medium 28%, uh, if I'm reading this right, um, which is encouraging. It's very encouraging. I'm feeling very encouraged by these results. I'm so glad we asked the questions. And once again, thank you so much to these presenters, um, to, to Danny, to Ali, to Joe, and to Emily, and to our panelists. We are so grateful that you could all come and all of you who attended. Um, we'll have the webinar recording 
and can share that and um, it'll be up on our website soon. Thank you and stay tuned for the next in this series of webinars that we'll be sharing with you.